Okay, so thank you very much, Anne, for today. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, if you're ready and you can share your uh, uh, PowerPoint slide and you can start the lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I just want to say uh, welcome to everyone and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, I was really excited to do this. Um, I have done about 200 lectures in the past few years um, in Japanese, and this is like my third one in English. So um, I'm really looking forward to trying a, a, a new thing and, and sharing my experiences about uh, living in Japan and how I have learned that language and culture and worldview are just so interconnected and understanding all of them is are, is just crucial to really getting to the Japanese heart. So um, today I'm gonna share a lot of experiences from my own life. It's not going to be a super academic type presentation, but more of uh, just me, an American, um, and how Japan has changed my life and changed my view of the world and changed my relationships with everyone around me. And I think the same thing can happen to you if you really can get a glimpse of the Japanese heart through understanding the worldview. So um, I want to say welcome to you. Um, my name is Anne Krasini. Like uh, I was um, introduced, I have lived in Japan for 21 years, and the last five years have been life changing for me. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that to you today. So today we're going to go over just the basic term sekaikan, which is worldview. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Japanese food culture and the connection to their worldview, um, the religious views, uh, how they see family. Um, and a very important concept called Hansei, which is really hard to translate into English. Um, and then just talk about some other trans hard to translate terms. So I was born in the United States on the East Coast in a town called Withville, Virginia. Uh, has, it's a very small town, has about 7,000 people. I never ate fish or rice uh, until I graduated from college, nor did I fly on an airplane. Um, but after I graduated from college, I met my current husband and he was assigned to the JET program. He was an ALT for the JET program, um, an English teacher in Japan. And we came over here in 1997. And I really struggled. I hated Japan the first six months. I had terrible culture shock. Um, I couldn't understand the language. I hated the food. The houses are just so cold because there's no central heating which is also connected to the worldview, but I'll talk about that later. Um, and it was just a really miserable experience for me. Um, I did not have any desire to learn Japanese, but uh, one day I moved from my host family to my um, own apartment. And in Japan, when you, when you move, you take a very practical gift to your neighbors. And usually something that is like a you can use up like, you know, like uh, dish detergent. And so I went out and bought some dish detergent and I practiced how to say the polite, you know, sumaranai mo desu ka. This is just such a trifling gift. And I knocked on the door and the lady said in Japanese, who is it? And I thought, oh my gosh, I cannot answer this question. I, I practiced the, how to say this is a trifling gift, but I never practiced how to say I'm your neighbor. So I thought about it for a while and then I ended up saying gaijin desu which means I am a foreigner. And I was so embarrassed by that, that I was motivated. And I said, the next day I am gonna study Japanese and I'm gonna enjoy my life in this country. And I found that as I learned to speak Japanese, that my enjoyment of life just went like this. They were parallel, they were connected. And that was the first time I really realized how important words and language are. They connect people to each other and that was the time that I just fell in love with the Japanese language. And from that point on, I think about it all the time from morning until night. And when I'm sleeping, I'm constantly thinking about Japanese. I love it. It is my passion in life. Um, and after I first came here um, in 1997, I didn't understand the culture or the language at all. But once I came into Japan and I started to learn language, I realized there was these words in Japanese that you can't translate into English. And I started to wonder, well, why don't we have these words in English? These words are so important to the Japanese people, especially words like yoroshiku onegaishimasu. I mean, you can't survive in Japan without using the word yoroshiku onegaishimasu. It is the glue of human relationships. And yet in English, we don't have it at all. 
Um, and all of these, and, and I started thinking, what is the link? Why are these, there's so many words? And then I started seeing certain patterns, like for example, uh, or uh, words like uh, these are all words that express the hi hierarchical relationship in Japanese culture. Words like senpai and kohai, which we don't have in English. People will say senior and junior, but we don't really say that all that much, right? And so I, I, I started seeing the, the connection between uh, the language and the culture, and I was fascinated with it. And so then um, I, uh, after that, I started thinking, uh, what about words like binyo and sasuga and ichio? Like, we don't have words like this in English at all. Um, but then I thought, well, these are the words that express Japan's uh, love of being vague, of, of, of being um, unclear as, as being a, a trait of beauty in the Japanese language. Um, the word binyo is actually a, a very, very deep, meaning word like it, it it actually is originally a, a buddhist term to, to express a very positive subtle delicacy kind of content and then it's gradually moved to a neutral meaning and now the way young people use binyo they write it in katakana with a long like a extended binyo and it means it's very negative it's gotten a negative meaning so words are alive they're constantly changing and words are always born from the culture and the world view that is underneath that So what happened about five years ago for me is I lived in, I had been living in Japan for 16 years. I spoke Japanese fluently. I passed level one of the Japanese proficiency exam. Um, I had three children in Japanese hospitals and sent and have always sent them to Japanese schools. And I published, I self-published 12 books on Japanese language and culture and in English textbooks. So I thought I've arrived. I'm a great uh, scholar of Japanese culture. But then about five years ago, I met my best friend, um, who's, she's, she's also my manager right now. Her name's Machiko. And we were just like teenagers, you know? Every now and then there's that one best friend that just appears once in your life and you're just so close and you feel like, oh, I never get tired of this person and we could be together forever. And we would stay up all night talking and eating ice cream and just having a great time. But we would also fight like crazy, like sisters. Like we, we just couldn't agree on things like child raising or uh, food and, and things like that. And I'm like, why am I fighting so much with her? Because I should know the culture better than this. I am a supposed Japanese expert. There's something I'm missing about the culture. There's something I'm missing that I'm not understanding. Um, Machiko was born and raised in Kyoto. She is the quintessential Japanese uh, the Japanese, you know, she is a traditional Japanese person. Our, our worldviews are different. Our, our languages are different. Our citizenship, our hobbies, our religion, everything is different. And so I realized there was something clashing in us that was not just culture and it was not just language. There was something that I was missing out on. And I was determined to figure out what that was. What is it? What is that missing link that I am just, I felt like I was seeing only half of Japan. I felt like I loved the language and I loved the culture, but there was a lot of this mysterious stuff about Japan that I just didn't get. And it was irritating and I didn't like it. And I found myself being one of those annoying foreigners that would just criticize Japan and say like, well, in my country, this, but in Japan, this. And I found myself unconsciously criticizing things that I couldn't understand or couldn't accept. Um, and I, I didn't even realize I was doing that. And one day, Machiko and I went to Kyoto together and uh, we were going to the temples and, and to the shrines. And I thought I was enjoying myself. And then when we were in the car on the way home, she said to me, I have a question for you. She said, she said the whole time we were in temples and shrines, you didn't want to be there. I could tell you couldn't wait to leave. She goes, I know that you're a devout Christian and I respect that, but if you feel so uncomfortable in shrines and temples, why in the world did you want to come to Kyoto, which is the center of the Japanese religious culture? And I just felt like I had been just punched in the stomach and I felt so just bad, like so just convicted in my spirit that I had had this unconscious attitude towards Japanese culture. And I was 
I was respectful of the things that I understood and I, and I liked the, the, the culture that, that was comfortable, but things that I didn't understand or things that I didn't agree with, I found that I was unconsciously looking down on it from this, I, I'm above it kind of view. And I was, that day, that conversation changed my life. And I decided that from this point on, I am going to spend my life seeking after the, all of the Japanese heart, everything in the culture, things I understand, things I don't, things I agree with, things I don't. And I'm going to do it with a spirit of respect and tolerance and love for this culture. And I'm going to change and I'm going to be a different person. And that day I decided that I'm going to live my life like that. This was five years ago. And I started on a journey to understand the Japanese heart, those deep things that I hadn't understood for the first 16 years of my time in Japan. About that time, I was asked um, to be in the TEDx Fukuoka uh, event. And that's where I, I first started to form my interest in understanding the Japanese worldview. Now, worldview is translated um, in Japanese as sekaika, which sekai just means world and kan just means view. And miru is to look, um, depending on the kanji, it changes how you actually use the word look. So worldview is just basically, how do you look at the world? Everyone wears glasses. And through those glasses, through those lenses, they look at the world in a different way. We don't see the same thing as people in other cultures see. We see everything around us based on how we're brought up, based on our religious upbringing, based on the people in our lives, based on the foods that we eat. Everything in, 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 in our upbringing, everything in the culture that we're uh, brought it in influences how we see the world. And I don't see the world the same way that Machiko sees the world. And that's the thing that really um, impacted me. If you can imagine, uh, you know, worldview and culture are very hard to understand the difference. So right now I'm going to explain to you in a very simple way how you can, why, why there's a subtle difference between worldview and culture and why it's so incredibly important if you really want to get to the Japanese heart. This is a very simple definition, but I think it's very powerful. Culture is what, worldview is why, okay? Culture is what, worldview is why. If you think about a house, okay, the, the culture is the parts of the house you can see. It's the, uh, the roof, it's the walls, it's the furniture, right? But the worldview is the foundation of the house. You can't see it, but if there's no foundation, there's no house, okay? So that's how I always look at worldview and culture. People's uh, thought patterns, people's behavior, and a country's culture all is born out of that foundation of worldview. So if there's ever something you see in Japan, I don't understand why the Japanese do that. I don't understand why they do that. I don't understand why that person is doing that. The answer is almost always found, I think, in the worldview. So to me, language, culture, and worldview are interconnected, and you cannot see one without looking at the other. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a personal experience that I had that, that really changed my life. And this is the word concept of itadakimasu. Now, I know that most of Japanese learners know this term, itadakimasu. We learned this. I learned this my first year in Japan, that it's the word the Japanese people say before they eat their meals, right? And I would say it like everyone else. I would say itadakimasu. And like everyone else, I thought I was just saying, let's eat. Right, because that's what I thought itadakimasu meant was let's eat. And one day I was cooking with Makiko, and we were making tamago kake gohan, which is just mixing raw egg with uh, white rice and putting soy sauce and things on top. And I have high cholesterol, so I was gonna throw away the yolk of the egg and just make it with the white part. And Makiko stopped me and she said to me, she said, "What are you doing?" And I said, well, I don't need this yolk because I have high cholesterol. It's bad for me. So I'm going to throw it away. And she said, what are you, are you crazy? She goes that don't you understand what the word itadakimasu means? And I said, well, yeah, itadakimasu just means let's eat. She goes, you're kidding, right? That's not what itadakimasu means. And I said, well, what does it mean? She goes, and this is what she told me. She said, it, it means inochi itadakimasu. You are partaking of life. You are saying thank you 
to the animals, to the plants for sacrificing their lives for you. And you're also saying thank you to all the people who grew the food, who harvested it, who transported it and prepared it for you. In other words, you are directly thanking everyone in the whole process from that food being the life of the animal, the plant, until it arrives on your table, you are saying thank you to everyone and everything involved in that process. So this to me was like one of those life-changing experiences. I'm like, wait a minute, I have lived in Japan for 16 years and I didn't know this. Why didn't I know this? This is like, this is like huge for me. And why is it huge for me? Because I had an eating disorder. I had anorexia for, for 25 years. When I was in high school, when I was in junior high school, I was very overweight. And uh, my basketball coach said, you need to lose weight to, uh, to be a better basketball player. So I lost like, you know, 40, 40 pounds, I guess, 20 kilos in like two or three months. And all of a sudden I'm so popular. I have all these friends and I thought, gosh, if I get fat again, nobody's going to like me. So from that point on, I had this, this hatred of food. I felt like food was my enemy, that it was torturing me, that it was trying to ruin my life. And I had numerous illnesses. I have ulcerative colitis. I got kidney stones. I had heart palpitations had all of these sicknesses and I was super skinny. I was, and I hated food. I couldn't enjoy food. I couldn't go on trips. I couldn't, uh, I exercised like three or four hours a day. I felt guilty all the time. And I was at the point where I thought, well, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm probably just, just going to die this way eventually because I can't beat this. You know, I tried counseling, I tried gluten-free, I tried vegetarian life, I tried all these kinds of diets, nothing worked for me. And I was at the bottom and I was just hopeless. And about that time, I met Makiko about five years ago, and she said to me, let's heal you with Japanese food. And to me, that was just like, okay, whatever. I mean, I tried everything, that's not gonna work. But I enjoyed spending time with her so much I said, okay, whatever, I'll try. But, you know, I hated cooking more than anything. Like to me, cooking was just like torture. I would go to the supermarket and buy all the half price uh, supermarket bentos, you know. I'd make friends with the ladies at the supermarket and they'd tell me when everything went half price. And that was how I ate for many, many years. And, um, but, you know, when I started cooking with Machiko and actually seeing food and seeing the food process, it would just like change my life. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is like, this is life that I, that, that I, that, and it's something I should value. And for the first time I found myself in 20 years, I found myself enjoying food. I found myself eating without feelings of guilt. And I found myself able to actually cook things that were good for my body. And I can tell you with complete confidence that the combination of Makiko teaching me how to cook Japanese food and my understanding of the true meaning of itadakimasu changed my life and helped me to conquer the eating disorder that I had for 25 years. I can say to you right now that I probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for meeting Mashiko and meeting the Japanese worldview when it comes to food. I feel like it saved me, to be honest with you. And so I feel this, in, this just passion and this just need to share this story with so many people because um, it changed my life so deeply. Just this one word, this one word, which expresses so much. And when I understood that I was partaking of life, that I this, this itadakimasu kind of mentality, I was, I saw food in a different way. And I understood so many things that I couldn't understand for so long about Japanese culture. Japanese people are absolutely crazy about food. They think about food and talk about food all the time. And I could never understand that when I came here. I'm like, why are Japanese people always talking about food? Like you turn on TV and every TV show is, there's a, like a, a celebrity eating something and talking about how great it is. Um, the, their bento culture and, and their cooking culture is just phenomenal. Um, preschool kids plant vegetables and they harvest them and cook their meals together. And the vocabulary to explain taste and texture of food is just tremendous. 
there's all these words in Japanese like shibumi, egumi, amami, nigami, umami, many of which we don't even have in English. And if we do, we don't really say them or we don't really think about them. I mean, as, as an American, the only tastes that I grew up with were sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. That was like my whole vocabulary of, of food uh, tastes. But when I came here, I learned these words like umami, which we don't really have in English. And so it's, it's become English just as umami. Things like egumi, um, which is like a, a kind of an astringency kind of taste that I still don't really understand. Um, shibumi is another word. If you want to understand what that is, try it's It's like eating an entire tube of toothpaste. If you, if you do that, you'll, you'll understand what shibumi is. Um, so there's all these words. And then there's all this onomatopoeia uh, to describe taste and things like kahoka means hot, fua fua means soft and fluffy, neba neba means sticky. These kinds of these kinds of words to explain the taste of food. And I felt like through understanding itadakimasu, I felt like for the first time I understood why Japanese people love food so much. And this is also found in the worldview because in the Shinto worldview. All life has the same value. And you are directly thanking that life for sacrificing you. Whereas in the West, um, many countries are influenced in the West by the Christian worldview in which you thank God for giving you the food, right? So when Christians pray before meals, they're thanking God for the food. But when Japanese people say itadakimasu, they're not thanking God. They're thanking directly the life for sacrificing themselves for them. This is a huge difference um, in understanding the worldview. Now, most Japanese people will tell you that they're not religious. You ask them their religion and they'll say, oh, I'm not religious. However, um, I have met very few atheists here in Japan. Um, most of them have a very unique worldview of Japan. I was a religion major in college and it was this data that fascinated me about Japan. They were the only country I studied that had more than 100% total when they ask people about their religion. And the reason for that is because of Shinto and Buddhism are coexisting together in Japan and uh, along with a very small amount of Christianity and um, Islam and um, Hindu and other Japanese religions. So look at these. It's, there's more than 100%. Why is that? Well, because um, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but and I'm going to talk about that later. But first of all, I want to talk a little bit about Shinto, which to me is the key to understanding the Japanese worldview. Shinto is the foundation of Japanese culture, and almost everything comes out of it, whether the Japanese people realize it or not. It means the way of the kami. Um, and while we in the West are taught that Shinto is a, the traditional Japanese religion, most Japanese people would not even consider Shinto a religion. It is just the Japanese way to live. And so if you ask them, is, do you know the, the word Shinto? Many, many of my students don't even know the word Shinto. They're like, what's that? You show them the kanji, I have no idea what that is. But if you say, oh, it's going to the temple. Oh, okay, I know what that is. It's so much ingrained in their life and in their consciousness that they don't even think of it as a religion because everything in Japanese culture, their thought patterns, their beliefs, itadakimasu, um, ideas, how they relate to their ancestors, how they relate to each other. Everything is based in Shinto or Buddhism, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Now, Shinto is, is, has this do on the end, which I'll talk about in a minute. These um, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, they have this kyo, bukkyo, kiristo kyo, islam kyo, hinzu kyo. And so these are very, have a strong feeling of religion to the Japanese people. However, Shinto is um, is a do, or the way or the path, just like Shinto, chado, or tea ceremony, kendo, uh, budo, judo, the Japanese martial arts, and shodo, which is Japanese calligraphy. So this is not as much of a religious thing that, that it is of a discipline of life, I think, for most Japanese people. Um, the word kami, which, which I'm going to talk about now, is the, the, the trouble translating terms. The term kami in Japanese is often translated as God, but I think that deity or spirit is a little bit of a better translation. Um, it's called the land of a million gods, uh, yaoyorozu no kami. 
and it's in other words the gods rely reside in everything it's a it's a an, an, an animistic a polytheistic society here in japan and everything um almost all of their life events come from uh this for example uh the, the new year's uh holidays cherry blossom viewing uh festivals their famous summer festivals uh the new year's money the kids get the tea ceremony sumo no and carrying the, the, the shrine. Many of these are traditional Japanese cultural events, and all of them are born from Shinto. And many of the Japanese don't even know that they're born from Shinto, um, especially things like the Otoshidama, the New Year's money. Um, this was an, um, originally a Shinto rite, um, as well as the uh, uh, cherry blossom viewing was originally um, done to, to, as a way to worship the Japanese gods. Many people don't even know these things, but these things, these words, these cultures all come from the foundation of Shinto. It's impossible to separate Shinto from uh, the Japanese religion of Shinto from the Japanese culture. They are so interconnected like Play-Doh, like red and blue Play-Doh that have just been crushed together. You can't separate them. They are one um, in, in Japanese culture. Um, Shinto and Buddhism uh, are coexisting peacefully. They're entirely different belief systems, but they still uh, coexist peacefully. There is no fighting. There's the sh people worship at both shrines and temples, um, and it's not a conflict at all to any of the Japanese people. It's they they po they uh, peacefully coexist together. Um, but they often have many things where they'll join together. Like for example, when a child is born. They have a system called Omiyamaidi, where they take the child to the shrine to pray for a healthy life and good health. Many people get married in a Christian style Western ceremony, um, and then the funerals are held in the Buddhist style. And Christmas, Obon, they all of the religions are mixed together. In the Japanese, they just they enjoy all religions and they enjoy everything, and they don't see any conflict at all um, that they're doing anything strange. It's just the Japanese way. Um, so um, a monotheist coming to Japan might come over and say, well, why are you celebrating Christmas? You guys aren't Christians. To them, that doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's culture. They're just borrowing culture and they're making it their own. And I think that that's totally fine. Um, and here I want to talk about something that as, as a religion major studying um, language, because I'm a linguist and I, and, I, and I was also a religion major, I found some very fascinating terms here. Um, and it just really was, was interesting because I studied Japanese religions when I was in college. And I came here and I'm like, wait a minute, these words don't mean what I think they mean. Like you ask a Japanese person this question, do you believe in God? And I guarantee you that they will not be able to answer that question easily. You ask a person living in the West, do you believe in God? And most of them will tell you quickly, well, yes, I do, or no, I don't. I'm an atheist, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I'm, 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 I'm Jewish. Most people will answer you one way or the other relatively quickly. But if you ask a Japanese person, do you believe in God? They'll be like, well, first of all, what does Shinji believe? That, but what does it mean to believe in something? And which God are you talking about? You know, I, I'm not really sure what you mean. Because when I asked my friend this question the first time, she just couldn't answer me. She was like, what, what do you mean do I believe in God? What does that even mean? You know, and so I think when, when you're studying these words in the West, um, if you're studying Japanese culture and you're studying these words believe or worship or ancestor worship or gods, you have to take in mind that the worldview of uh, an animistic religion or a polytheistic religion is not the same. They don't have the same starting point as a monotheistic religion. And so the words don't mean the same thing to them as they do to a monotheist, even though you think you're using the right translation and you are using the closest translation, but it still doesn't mean the same thing as you, to them as it does to you. Why? Because you're looking at the world through different glasses. Right, you're looking at the world through the, the worldview, and the the glasses are not the same. So, to me, that's something that really impacted me um, as a linguist and as a religion major. Is saying, you know what? 
I always saw ancestor worship because, I, because I'm looking at, at, at ancestor worship from a monotheistic perspective, right? So I thought ancestor worship is like, you're like sitting in front of the Buddhist altar and you're praying to your mother or your father as if they are like the, like a, the, the only God, because as a monotheist, you believe in one God, right? But when I came here, I'm like, you know what? When they sit in front of the altar and they're talking to their mother and father, it's not any different from what a Christian will do when they're going to the, the grave of their grandmother and just talking to them. But why? Because I'm, I'm influenced by the Christian idea of worship, right? In, in, in Christianity, worship has the meaning of you're offering your, your, all of your heart, all of your praise to one God. But in the Japanese word, the suhai, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing uh to them as it means to us it's entirely different concept and so you really need to take into perspective the cultural and worldview differences when you're looking at language and you need to have a, a heart of humility and think maybe i'm not understanding something maybe as a westerner i don't understand the full part of the culture maybe there's something about the worldview you always need to be asking why why is that why is that i want to understand this I want to I want to understand the Japanese heart. I'm not right. You're not wrong. This is what I please teach me. You need to have this this humble heart where you're looking at someone from the same line and not like I'm above you kind of mentality. And I think all humans have a tendency to think that they're right and their culture is right and that, you know, I, I have things to teach the other culture. But in reality, you we are all learners we're all learners from each other and we need to have hearts of humility and learn from everybody around us. So they have these terms too, like, for example, everyone says to me, ah, you must have been Japanese in a previous life, you know? And I'm like, I don't even, have, as, a, as, as a monotheist, I don't really, I, I never really had that concept of, wait, I don't have a previous life, but this is so much a part of their culture. Like, because the concept of being reborn is such a part of their uh, religious worldview that it's just a common thing that is born, that shows up in the language, in the daily conversation in Japanese. And, you know, things like words like in, um, sticking that in, consciously, this interconnectedness of all beings, this comes from Buddhism. And that also shows up in daily conversation. And then this bachiya atario, if you do something, it's going to come back and bite you, like you're going to get punished if you do something bad. That's a concept of, you know, karma um, and things coming back, the retribution that's found in Japanese culture as well. So their worldview and their culture is very evident in the language. Okay, so you need to always remember that if there's something in Japanese that maybe you don't understand in your own culture, this probably would be something related to a worldview, a basic worldview difference. So um, as a linguist and as someone who's also a religion major, I think that the key, the, probably one of the main keys to understanding Japanese culture and understanding the Japanese language is understanding their Japanese religious views based in Shinto, Buddhism, and Confucianism. The three, these three things make up what I call the Japanese religious view, the Japanese religion, because most Japanese will tell you that they're non-religious, but Buddhism, Shinto, and Confucianism have a, a massive influence on Japanese culture, on Japanese language, um, and on Japanese behavior. So if you want to understand human relationships, Japanese family, um, if you want to understand um, the, how, they, how they interact with each other, the answer is always going to be found in the worldview and in, 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 in their religious views, I think. Um, you can see differences in worldview in how they raise children. Basically, in Japan, the child is the center of the family, whereas in the West, especially in the United States, the, the parent's relationship is the center of the family. That's why you have these cultural differences, because how you look at family is different. Um, for example, if a Japanese uh, couple until their child is born, they'll call each other by their first names. But right after a child is born, all of a sudden they start calling each other mama and papa. Why? Because their roles have shifted from we are the center of the family 
to the child is the center of the family and our roles are now papa and mama and that is in those that worldview is expressed in all of the ways that you see on this slide um and in in this thing really was a was fascinating to me when i had children in japan I'm like why why do the japanese people always sleep with their their kids why why does everything is a hundred percent evolves around the child and the parents seem to lose their own interest in their identity why because in the japanese worldview that's how it is the child is the center of the family and everything changes accordingly which one is good which one is bad nobody is has any right to judge every culture every worldview is different and we have to be accepting of that um, and really seek with humility to understand it and and and, and, and respect it as well um, the last thing I want to talk about today is this concept of hanse, which is really, really hard to translate into English. If you look it up in the dictionary, it will say reflection, reconsideration, introspection, mediation, contemplation. But none of them really grasp the essence of the word hanse. Um, and I think that is because worldview and cultural differences, which I'm going to explain right now, and I'm going to wrap up uh, this talk and take some questions. First of all, um, the first there's three stages of hansei in Japanese. The first thing you do when something goes wrong in a relationship, the first thing you do is apologize. First thing. Then you reflect on what went wrong, and then you make a plan so that doesn't happen again. Okay. These are the three stages of hansei. Hansei is crucial in Japanese relationships, especially in business relationships. If something goes wrong, the first thing you do is apologize. Then you decide why did it go wrong? And then you make a plan so it doesn't happen again. Sounds simple, right? It sounds very simple. However, as Westerners, this is the problem. As a Westerner, or, and, 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 and especially like as an American, Americans do not apologize for things they don't think are their fault. Okay, so if there's a problem in a business relationship and something goes wrong, the first thing an American will say is, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. If it's not my fault, I'm not going to apologize. But the term, it's not my fault, watashi no seijanai, you hardly ever hear that in Japanese conversation because it doesn't matter. It's whether it's your fault or not, it's totally unrelated to the concept of hansei. You apologize anyway. If you don't apologize, you're going to wreck the relationship. And so you have to apologize. And then after you apologize, you, you may, it, it may not be your fault, but you're taking responsibility for it, right? So after you apologize, you reflect, okay, why did this happen? Why did we have this problem? And then after that, you make a plan so the same thing doesn't happen again. These are the three steps that are crucial to Hansen. So what happens if an American or a Brit or an Australian doesn't understand this concept. They're in a relationship, in a business relationship, something goes wrong. And the first thing uh, the Westerner says, it was not my fault, right? And the Japanese is looking at this Westerner and saying, why doesn't this Westerner apologize? Where's the Hansei? And if, if there's no Hansei, we can't have a relationship. And so the problem here the breakdown in the relationship is between the culture, the cultures are, are, are different, right? And so that's why there's this word hansei in Japanese that we don't really have a good word for in English. Every word in the dictionary, I think, is missing the mark of the term of hansei. So it's impossible to translate a term into a language, into a culture where that concept doesn't exist. That's the thing you need to remember the most from this talk today is that if there is not a word to express something in Japanese that's in English or in English that's in Japanese, the reason for that is probably because there's no concept. Why do we not have words for senpai and koha? Well, because we don't have that system of rank in relationship in high school or on sports team. We don't have that system, and so we don't have a word to express it. Okay, why don't we have the word for tanshin funi? Do you guys know this word, tanshin funi? This is when a father or a mother goes to another city or another country 
uh, to live for work separated from the family and no one knows when the father or mother is going to be returned to their family. We don't have a word for this um, in English because we don't, that concept is very rare for a father or a mother to be, to leave the family behind. Why? Because the family will move together when something is transferred, you know, so if there's no concept in a language, there's not going to be a word for it. And if you're, if you try to, to translate it anyway, you, it's going to be awkward, it's going to be bulky, and you're going to miss the essence. And that's what happened to me. I tried for years to translate itadakimas as let's eat. And yeah, it's, it's the only thing we really have. It's the closest word we would have in English. But that is like doing such a disservice to the word itadakimas to translate it as let's eat. And so um, I think that instead of trying to awkwardly or bulkily translate a word like to to force the translation i think it's better just to use a lot of words in a long sentences to explain it to someone and i think if you come across in your studies a word that is not translatable or a word you can't really understand i really challenge you to really see well, why don't we have this word in english it's probably because we don't have that concept and i really challenge you to seek to know the, 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 the reason there's not a word and look at the culture and look at the worldview underneath it. Um, it's really important to, to, to learn, to, to face language study, to face cultural studies, to face worldview studies with a heart of humility because we don't know everything and we can learn from each other. We can grow from, from, other, um, from our, our relationships. We can see the world in new and amazing ways. Um, we can, we, we constantly need to reevaluate and to have this hanse, right, to, to apologize, to seek to grow, to seek to, to, to learn from our mistakes. And we always need to be open to the people of other cultures and other belief systems because we are not always right as humans. We, 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 we make mistakes and we need to always be willing to learn from other people. And this was a transformation in my life um, that has changed my, my, my life as a scholar. It's changed my, my relationship with my family and with my friends. It's changed my relationship with the culture. And it's just, I've been transformed by the concept of, of worldview. And it's my mission in life to understand the Japanese heart. And that's what I'm seeking after. Um, this is, this is, these are some of the ways I do it. I make my own miso now to try to understand the food culture. I'm learning how to play the shamisen and uh, kimono. I'm learning how to wear kimono. Um, and I just want to tell you, I just want to challenge you guys to always seek after the why. Anytime you're studying language, don't just study language. Study the culture, study the worldview that's underneath that. And if there's, don't just look at the what, seek after the why, because it's the why that is going to bring you close to the heart of Japan. It's the why that's going to bring you closer to your Japanese friends. It's the why that's going to help you to grow as a person. Um, it's not the what. The what is a very surface thing that anyone can learn. The why is something that really brings you close to the heart of Japan. And so I want to challenge you as you're studying your language, as you're studying Japanese, um, as you're studying culture, to always seek after that why and never be satisfied with the what because it can really change your life. It can change your perspective. It can give you a deeper relationship with Japan and a deeper relationship uh, with the people around you. So um, yeah, if you guys want to contact me anytime, I'd be glad to talk to you. I, I do Twitter, Instagram, and I have a Japanese uh, uh, YouTube channel called Anchan no Kutubakafe. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, yeah, please check it out. And I'd be glad to take any questions that you guys might have during the last part of this uh, seminar. So thanks so much. And I enjoyed talking to you. Wow, this was really short. I usually talk for a lot longer than that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, so Anne. Thank you so much, Anne, for the uh, fascinating lecture. Can you hear Thank me? You. Oh, that's yes. Great. Thank you so much. I, I never saw, I, I used to think I'm a very non-religious person really, but uh, after I heard about your you know, I talk about the uh, Shintoism and Buddhism that kind of mixed together in the culture of Japan. I, I feel like I'm quite religious. <laughs> yeah, that's really there's, interesting. Experience there's very me. few, there's very few non-religious, there's very few atheists in Japan. I've never met an atheist in Japan, not once. Yeah. 
yeah I used to think I'm quite atheist but yeah I kind of I have to rethink about that yeah thank you so much for the teaching yeah it's, uh, everybody so uh, please uh, put the uh, question in a Q&A Q &A function uh, and then uh, I'm gonna we're gonna review this uh, question so uh, there was a question from you Papa and can you see this yes Okay, so it's more like a re realization than question. Listening to your talk, I realized why Japanese uh, gender equality is still very backward and fem uh, females are always feeling guilty not pursuing the mother role, which obligated as a member of a society. How could we don't change this fundamental Japanese worldview, uh, but change Japanese gender per perception better? How to teach perception at the outside Japan? I think this is something that I really struggled with because when I came to Japan, I felt the same pressure, like to be the perfect mother because everyone around me was making these like karabin, like these character bentos and, and was like making everything for school. And, and, you know, there's this perfect mom. And then, you know, I have never been the, the domesticated type, you know, like where I, just, I don't really, I've never really loved to cook. I've never really liked to sew. Um, I would go off and I would climb Mount Fuji and leave the kids with my husband and all my friends would be like, well, how can you leave your kids like that? I can't believe it, you know? And, um, and it's something I struggle with, but like one day I realized that we all have our own gifts and the things I'm doing right now with my, my speaking and my writing, the, the mothers around me are not doing that. I'm, I have my own gifts and my kids, they'll go to school and they'll be like, mommy, I'm so proud of you for working so hard. And I'm so proud of you for being on TV. And I realized that every woman has a different role and that every woman loves her kids in a different way. And I think that Japanese women need to realize that there's not just one way to be a perfect mom, that there's lots of ways to love your family and to love your kids. And I think up until now, it's been like the Japanese women have been in this box and there's just only one way you can, you can be the Japanese mom. There's one Japanese mom and that's it. But I think that society is gradually changing. There's a lot more working mothers and, 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 a, and a lot of women are finding their voice and they're finding that they can love their kids and work and, and, and find their own identity and live their lives without feeling the guilt and the shame that they have up until now. But, you know, as in everything in Japanese society, change is very slow. Um, it takes a long time to change, especially gender roles are really, are really set, but they are changing too. Um, many schools are going to genderless uniforms um, there's been a lot of changes um, uh, regarding L, um, LGBT situation too in Japan. So, but you know, Japan is very behind on gender stuff. I mean, I, I had to take, I had to take, um, I had to take maternity leave, even though it was unpaid. They made me take it because it was Japanese law. And as a, as a Westerner, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you cannot. You, you, how can you make me take unpaid maternity leave? That just just hit every bit of my feminist like like bone you know but you know a mother needs to be with her kids and she's weak after having a baby that 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 worldview is just that that thought pattern is just so strong in japan but you know that's changing too it's just everything is changing it's just at a very slow pace i think so yeah. thank you Anne. Uh, there was another question uh, from okay. kiara hi Anne. great presentation since having all those thoughts about a worldview and uh, subconscious uh, superiority, uh, do you and others notice the change in how you experience shrine visit and other Shinto events? Have you been back to Kyoto since that time with Makiko and felt differently? I think I think now that I realize that I I, I have a deep respect for Shinto and Buddhism that I never had before. Um, I. Because, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, I, I'm a Christian, but the Shinto worldview on foods saved me pretty much, right? And so I feel deeply, uh, you know, you don't have to have the same worldview, you don't have to have the same, the same way of thinking, but you can still be deeply impacted and changed by another a religious view or, or, or a different worldview. And so I feel very, very, very thankful. Um, to the Shinto worldview about food. And so um, I, you know, I'm not Shinto, but I have a deep respect for it. And when I go to shrines, um, I, I do everything I can to honor that system. I, I don't walk in the middle 
of the sun though because i want to respect that i, I walk to the sides just like you know all japanese people and i, I i'm very respectful and reverent and, and it's a it's a very peaceful place and i'm very thankful to it and, and, I, and i have been back to kyoto and, and i did experience it differently it, it did felt differently um i went to heian uh heian jingu to a wedding in heian jingu in kyoto which was a really powerful experience for me so definitely my view of shinto and buddhism has changed uh since uh this experience and and, and i've learned that you know you don't have to have the same belief system to deeply respect or honor someone someone else's belief system and i think that could be a revolutionary idea that could change the world you know if people could just see like you know if you just respect everyone even if you don't believe it it's important to someone else and they believe it and so if you love them you need to honor that and respect that about them so yeah thank you and there was a question from emmy uh what is your favorite word in Japanese which cannot be expressed in English? That's quite, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and it, it would have to be itadakimasu because that word really changed my life. But um, but there's a lot of words. Like, I, I really like the word paper driver, pipa <laughs> driver, um, which, you know, is uh, because I'm a Japanese English researcher. Uh, I study loan words and, and, you know, foreign terms and, um, I love paper driver because it expresses someone who has a driver's license but doesn't drive based on lack of confidence or fear or something. And, you know, I, I don't know how it is in, in, in the United Kingdom, but in, in America, there's no people like that. Americans are like brimming with confidence, you know, when they get behind the wheel. They're like, ah, no problem, you know. And so, you know, there's people who don't drive because they don't need to drive because they're in the city. But the, the idea of like, having lack of confidence or you're being afraid of driving, um, we don't really have people, or I've never met anybody who's kind of like that, you know. So, and, and if you say paper driver in the US, people are going to think of like a newspaper delivery service or something, you know. So that's probably my favorite Japanese English word, paper driver. Um, yeah. There's a lot of words. I mean, it, it, if I start talking about words, I would like talk for like five hours. So I, I should probably stop right there. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Paper driver. I quite like that too. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a Michiko Miller here. She's uh, raising her hand. Michiko, are you there? Uh, if you have a question, if you could uh, type your a question in a chat box, that would be great. Chat box or Q&A box. Thank you. And there was another question from uh, Denusha. Uh, do you have any idea of teaching worldview to our students, especially, uh, especially to inter international students? How can we teach it in it, our language classes? I'm actually, I'm actually teaching a seminar right now at my university on worldview. Um, and um, I, I write a newspaper column here in, in Fukuoka. I've been writing it for about three years. And so I use my articles and, and it's actually going to become a book next. It's being published as a book next month. But um, I, I use that to teach differences in worldview regarding different things like education, child raising, uh, language usage, uh, marriage, uh, gender roles, um, because I don't think it's, it's, it's possible to learn uh, language or to understand culture apart from, from the worldview. And so I have been teaching that class for two years at my university, and I find that the students, they just love it because they've never been challenged to think at a deeper level, they just see, like I did for 16 years, just the surface level. You know, all oh, Japanese people like to eat. Uh, Japanese people sleep with their family. Like they, you know, they they only see the what, you know, but like, you know, like Americans have guns and they kill each other with guns. That's all they see, right? And and so, but they don't understand like, why is that? Why do Americans, how, why are Americans so crazy obsessive about the right to have guns? Right, so I teach them that from the American worldview, from from the from history, from from things like that. And so you might not agree with it, but at least understand why things are like they are. And, and I think that's really important. That, that you don't have to agree with everything, but it's it's important to understand why people act like they do, why cultures act like they do, why even your friend acts like she does. I mean, there's different worldviews even among people of the same culture, right? They're, you know, the, uh, of the same gender. I mean, there's different worldviews all around you. And I think if you really love and honor someone around you, you owe them the, to understand 
why they're doing what they're doing instead of just looking at the what, which is very important. So is there any more questions in the chat? Let's see. No more questions? Do you have any questions, Maya Song? Well, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. I think you're muted. Can you unmute? Oh, yourself? hi, hi. Sorry. Uh, there was one more question from Christopher okay. Hood. Uh, he's my colleague. Uh, how okay. do you think we should discuss concepts like uh, Sekaikan when there are so many differences between people of the same nationality or culture? Generalization are, are problems, surely, he said. Sure. And, and that's what I, you know, like when I talk about Sekaikan based on Japanese culture and American culture is, you know, because those are the two things that I'm, I'm most familiar with. I always, I always say, well, this is, you know, a generalization. Of course, it doesn't apply to everybody. Even within the Japanese culture, people have different sick icons, have different worldviews. In, in the American culture, for sure, people have different worldviews. But there, there are general patterns. There are general trends, I think, that you can see um, uh, in a culture based on the, the religious uh, views, especially in Japan. Um, based on like, for example, in the States, the idea of freedom, like I've, I've gotten so much, so much writing material, just watching how different cultures have, have responded to the COVID-19 pa um, pandemic. You can see so much worldview and so much cultural beliefs and so much of the thought system of the people by how they respond to the pandemic, by how uh, Japanese people love, uh, will, will are obedient and they'll wear a mask, whereas Americans, like, they don't want that. Or the, the Japanese are saying to the government, please protect us, where the Americans are saying, leave us alone. Like, you can see a lot of the, the, the worldview of a people, of, of a country, by how, they, how, how they've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. But, but of course, you can't generalize the whole culture. Like, there's plenty of Americans who wear masks, right? And there's some Japanese who don't wear masks. So you can't say, well, this is everybody. And that's something I, I drill into my students too, is that I'm just giving you just, just a general overview, but you can't, you can't stereotype every person to have the exact same belief system. Um, so yeah, that's something that, I, that I'm, I'm very careful that I do when I teach the concept of world. Mm. Thank you, Anne. So uh, uh, it's two past two minutes past eleven. So we need to go. And then, uh, but uh, could you hold a sec? Let me share the screen. Hold a sec. Uh, was it? Yep. So uh, thank you so much, Anne, for the amazing lectures today. And then uh, I'm sure lots of you still want to hear your voice. But uh, if you are uh, very, uh, if you are interested in Anne's work, and uh, as I told you, Anne has published. Uh, so many books uh, through the uh, ma major Japanese uh, publishing companies. So you can, if you put, uh, uh, if you type Anne's name in Amazon or you know all other bookstore, online bookstore, you can uh, refer her books, uh, publications, and things. And also, uh, as I told you, uh, all this uh, recorded session uh, will be in YouTube uh, with the help of Anne and Chris. Uh, thank you. And so please check this uh, Cardiff online lecture series uh, YouTube channel later on. And then also we would be very grateful if you could complete this short survey to tell us your opinion and uh, about this lecture. And that would be a very good uh, for our future events and things. And then the survey will be automatically sent to you, sent to you later after this uh, lecture finishes. Thank you so much. And, and so thank you so much for today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I hope you're going to have a, a nice evening. Uh, I'm sure uh, quite late in Japan. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, everybody, thank you for coming to the uh, uh, Cardiff online lecture series today. And uh, uh, the next lecture series hasn't been scheduled yet. But as soon as I organize the next uh, session, I'll let you know. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, arigatou gozaimashita. Arigatou gozaimashita. Sayonara. あの、今度日本語で話すね。はい、お願いします。お願いします。はい、さよなら。グッバイ。ディオール。<笑>